Right, so um, good morning everybody. So we're in the um, standards of care sort of like session in here all day today. And uh, we've already heard about respiratory. And my name is Jared Wong, one of the uh, consultants in uh, Glasgow. And my interest is in bone health and endocrine issues in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And again, very similarly, I'll talk you through uh, the updated standards of care. And there'll be four sections that I'll be concentrating on. And hopefully, in the next 40 minutes, we'll be able to cover uh, some of these sections. And some might be new, or some of you may have heard these talks or sessions of these talks. And firstly, um, at lunchtime, we've got two posters. Um, around the issue of bone health and uh, muscular dystrophy UK Action Duchenne and the Scottish Government have funded us to run an observational study uh, looking at bone health and endocrine issues in uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and we've got some uh, preliminary results to share in our posters. So f firstly to say is that, and I think if, I'm not sure if the people in Action Duchenne in the room, and it might just be useful to just flag this up on the website, is that uh, um, You've already heard about the updated standards of care, and this has been published this year in January in Lancet Neurology. But Treat NMD and various patient organizations all over the world have, in fact, actually uh, developed a patient friendly version of the standards of care. It is available online at various websites. It's actually hosted on the Treat NMD website. I'm aware that Action Duchenne, Muscular Dystrophy UK, Duchenne UK have actually put this up uh, a few months ago, but it might just be worthwhile flagging up again. First thing to say, although it's patient friendly, it's not necessarily bedtime reading because it is still 60 pages. So all I'm trying to, all I would encourage you is that take your time to digest it and there'll be things that you'll hear all throughout this conference, particularly in standards of care, which may or may not be related to your child because depending on which phase of the condition your child is, but these are useful because in fact, actually, it's just a patient friendly of the exact standards of care and you know this is where we should be aiming for. So do look out for them. So the first session I want to talk about is something which is very new in the standards of care and which um, some of you who've had Duchenne's or lived with Duchenne's for a long period of time may not have been, may not have been addressed based on the past standards of care. And this relates only to boys who are on long-term steroids and it's the issue of adrenal suppression or adrenal insufficiency because of the use of long-term steroids and how we should manage during times of severe illnesses, okay? So uh, we need to talk a little bit about um, what happens normally. So the pituitary gland is a little gland that's just the size of P, which sits at the base of the skull. And it's actually a gland which is the master regulator of all hormones in the body. The pituitary gland makes a whole lot of signals which control lots of hormonal function in the body, and you'll hear about two of its function. And it really makes a signal, which is called ACTH, and it tells the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands are two glands that sit um, on top of the kidneys, and the adrenal glands, all of us will have adrenal glands, and adrenal glands make steroid hormones. So all of us have steroid hormones. It keeps us well, it keeps us healthy, it helps us fight infection, it helps us fight stress. During times of infections and stress in all of us, um, steroid, uh, steroid production in the adrenal gland increases about two or three times to cope with the stress and to fight with infection. Now what happens is that when your boys with Duchenne are prescribed doses of prednisolone or the flasicord, the dose of steroid is much, much higher, sometimes in excess of what, of about 50 times higher than what our gland would produce. And what this happened is that the human body is fascinating and, and clever in a lot of ways because it then senses that there's a lot of steroids in the system. And because of this use of steroid and the flasicord for a long period of time, it tells the pituitary gland to actually switch off the signal that tells the adrenal glands to make steroids. This is absolutely fine when, you're, you're, when, when the boy with Duchenne or your son is not ill because you're taking lots of steroids, you've got lots of steroids on board, but it becomes an issue or can become an issue if your son has severe illness and is unable to tolerate oral steroids. And this is when the new standards of care recommends that we need to put some, uh, some, some, some guide, guidelines of actions in place. And what happens is that if you've got a boy with Duchenne's or any condition for, for matter of fact, who takes steroids, high doses of steroids, for more than six to 12 months, because of that effect, it tells the pituitary gland to switch down 
the signal and the adrenal glands become sleepy. And that's kind of what I explained to my families. You can hear the word adrenal insufficiency or adrenal suppression. And in those instances, if your child is very sick, particularly with vomiting illness and is unable to tolerate steroids, we need to look onto giving steroids in alternative form. So there needs to be an emergency plan in place. And there's some information that we've developed in Scotland, which is available on the Scottish Muscle Network. And in the ideal situation, if your boy is very sick, we need to be able to inject steroids in the form of injectable forms prior to presenting to hospital or at least at the point of presenting to hospital. But what's more important than the injectable steroids is that you need to make sure that there is an emergency plan in place. And generally, in most countries, all boys should carry a steroid card, which tells of this risk of adrenal suppression or in adrenal insufficiency. In the hospital, we need to make sure that there is a system which flags this problem up. So when you come to a and &E or you see a non-specialist, not one of us, that this problem is flagged up. And that's important because in serious vomiting illness, not mild illnesses, not mild flu or mild fever, and when your son is unable to tolerate oral steroids, or in some instances, if for your instance, your son has appendicitis and needs to have an operation because that's a major stress, and the first two days after the operation can't eat anything, for instance, and can't take his oral steroids, uh, we then need to make sure that the steroids is given in another form and in those instances, most likely through a drip as we probably will be giving your son some fluids at that time anyway. But what's also very important is that if there is a decision to stop steroids uh, after years of taking steroids, you need to consult carefully with your neuromuscular consultant because there needs to be a plan of slowly weaning off steroids and you can't just stop suddenly because the gland will be sleepy. Does that kind of make sense? Did you want me to go through anything again? There'll be questions after this. This is kind of relatively newly addressing the consensus, but this is something that perhaps that, that we all know about that was just, just wasn't as clear cut. So the main crux of this part of the standards of care is that if your son is sick and on steroids and unable to tolerate steroids, you need to know of an emergency plan of what to do. And it could just be as simple as presenting to hospital quickly and telling the emergency doctors. So that's adrenal suppression. Let's talk about growth issues, which is another endocrine problem that we commonly encounter in boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. For reasons we don't quite understand yet, approximately 20 to 25% of boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy are already short, even quite early on, without the use of steroids. We are not clear why yet, and there's a lot of research that's being done. No doubt about it, we know that steroids were useful for the muscles and for the heart and for the lungs, as we've heard, there's a lot of benefits of steroids. It no doubt has its side effects, and one of it is in fact actually further reduces growth or increases growth problems. And it's not infrequent that two, three, four years down the line after having steroids, particularly daily steroids, we see that a lot of these boys just do not grow at all and they become shorter and shorter, so to speak. So height monitoring is very important. It's essentially not a major issue if the, when the boy is ambulant because we can get standing height. Height is also very important because we need that to interpret weight in body mass index because height is part of the equation. We talk about also monitoring blood pressure and lung function and all, and all these measurements need to be interpreted in the context of height. So you, measuring height is very important, but the need the new standards of care suggest that um, even at, during the ambulance phase, what we should do as clinicians is start measuring this thing called the ulnar length, it's the length of the, of the hand, which then can be put into an equation to help estimate the total height of the child. And this is something which I suppose facilitates measurement of height when the boy loses ambulation. There are some concerns because the um, uh, estimated height from ulnar length and standing height is probably not exactly the same and I think the ulnar length measurement is probably higher but at least it just means that we've got some height measurements so if you start seeing that measured in clinic that's sort of part of standards of care but what can we do with short children or children who are not growing so well and I know there's quite a lot of uh, discussions perhaps online or some of you may have read about it and some patients and boys may have tried it is can growth hormone improve growth and growth and short stature, it's at least a 
major problem for some boys with trans muscular dystrophy. So there's hardly any studies. There's really just one small study from America. Uh, it's not a clinical trial. It's certainly not recommended routinely in the new standards of care. Depending on where you live as well, um, pres uh, growth hormone prescription or growth hormone use can be very tightly regulated. In the UK, this is not a licensed indication, so the general practitioner could actually afford, uh, uh, have uh, in all the right to not prescribe it. Um, but the feel is that in that one small study in boys with Duchenne's and other chronic conditions in childhood where the children are treated with steroids is that if we could give growth hormone to these children, children may grow, but they will still remain very short. So growth rate improves marginally, but the boys still remain very short. So this is not generally used all the time. Growth hormone is given by injections, and it needs to be daily injections, and you need to give it faithfully for it to really work. There are also side effects, and it's already shown in the uh, study in the boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, including high blood sugar and diabetes, which necess necessitate treatment, and also potentially raise pressure around the eye. So there are some side effects, and it's not something to actually just uh, uh, do routinely. It's certainly not recommended routinely in standards of care. Let's talk about puberty, and um, some of you uh, may already uh, uh, experience problems with uh, pubertal disorders or delay puberty or absent puberty in adolescence. And this seems to be an issue, particularly with boys who are on daily steroids. Um, and steroids, again, has an effect on switching down the signal which the pituitary gland makes, which tells puberty to start. And whilst there's not a lot of uh, information yet, but certainly from our own research study, uh, the feel is that particularly boys who are on daily steroids will not go through puberty. And I think as our boys are growing up and living more fruitful lives, I think this is something that we need to address and not assume that being like their peers is not an important thing because I think it's very important our boys are going to university, having friends and living fruitful lives. So it's important that they're assessed and potentially treated, and I'll talk about that. Puberty, uh, male hormones or sex, sex hormones are actually very important for muscles and also bones. Now, does it actually have an, an impact on improving muscle and bones in Duchenne's? We're not quite clear, but we know very clearly in the elderly, as sex hormone declines, bones become weaker and muscles become weaker. So it may actually be an important issue at least to assess and considering treating. Now, how do we assess puberty? We assess puberty by careful clinical examination of the genitals in the boy, and particularly of the testy size, with these little beads called the orchidometer, and I carry that around as an, as an endocrinologist. It needs to be done by somebody who's got experience doing it, because in fact, actually, as the earliest signs of puberty, there may not actually be any pubic hair. The genital may look quite immature, but the testy size is increasing. The new standards of care says that puberty should be examined routinely from the age of nine every six monthly. I think that's quite unrealistic, and I think it's best to actually do these examinations uh, carefully and done by people who are experienced by doing it. And I suppose in the italics is what I would say that every boy who's on steroids must be, have their puberty examined by the age of 13, at least once, uh, to document there is puberty or progression. So uh, standards of care says that nine, six monthly, if that's done in your clinic, brilliant, but I think uh, if not by adolescence, that actually should be addressed. So let's talk again about how puberty starts and some sort of uh, uh, biology again about hormones, just like the picture earlier about steroids. We know the pituitary gland is a gland that sits at the base of the skull. It sends a whole lot of signals which help different hormones to work in the body. And with regards to puberty, it secretes two signals or two switches called the LH and FSH. And if that switch is switched on or those signals are, uh, are circulating, it says that puberty has started. LH and FSH are signals which tells the testicles in boys to increase in size. As testicles increase in size, it then secretes testosterone hormones, which leads to all the funny things that happens to adolescent boys, uh, the bits growing, the hair, and all the strange behavior that we all, all of us go through, or the men at least. So steroid medicine similarly, um, uh, with the adrenal suppression, prednisolone and the when prescribed at high doses, 
a long period of time, uh, dampens down the central sickness, which tells puberty to start. So puberty is often delayed, and in fact, actually often is absent if you actually do not address them or assess them if you continue on daily steroids. So what do we do? So we um, assess puberty, like I say, not just by um, break hair, uh, um, hair appearing or voice deepening. We need to carefully examine the testicle size, and you can see the ochidometer there. And when the testis size is four mils, that's obviously clearly not to scale, <laughs> uh, puberty has started. Now what the standards of care say is that if you've examined puberty and an adolescent boy is the age of 14 and there's no signs of puberty at all, we need to discuss the use of testosterone therapy if the decision is to carry on taking daily, uh, steroids, particularly daily steroids, i.e. prednisolone or dantoflazacone. Uh, testosterone therapy can be given by injections. Um, it may be more convenient for some people because that's only just given once a month. You can get creams or gels that needs to be done daily and done carefully, uh, particularly if it's a mum, you need to be gloved and you need to wash your hands very carefully. There are also tablets, which unfortunately uh, in some places in the UK seems to run in and out of supply quite often, but there are also increasingly other types of preparation of testosterone therapy. The standards of care say that we can consider testosterone therapy if there's no, no puberty in an adolescent boy with Duchenne from the age of about 12. And generally what tends to happen is that doses need to be gradually grow, uh, built up and increased to adult doses up to about three years period just to mimic normal puberty. Now I've talked about how the switch needs to switch on for, uh, for puberty to start and, tes and testicles needs to increase in size. Now occasionally, of course, during the point of between 14 to 18, there might be a decision, for instance, to either reduce doses of steroids or actually uh, stop steroids. And that might actually um, uh, uh, get, allow puberty to waken up by itself. And in those instances, during testosterone therapy, that your son will need to have his puberty examined regularly, six to 12 monthly. And if the testicle size starts to increase, remember when the testicle size increases, it means that the switch has woken up, which means that endogenous puberty has started. So if the testicle has gone up to about eight mils, and eight mils testes uh, is actually equivalent to uh, 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 teasers basically, not to suggest that you need to compare <laughs> testicle size at home to teasers. Uh, it suggests that things are wakening up and that's probably at that point in time, if that happens, uh, it's, it's time to stop testosterone therapy. But now we've got a new generation of men um, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy as well who are now continuing steroids indefinitely and we don't actually have that many of those men yet. Now if the idea is that steroid therapy dampen the switch for puberty and hormones, it's possible that some of our men who stay on daily steroid therapy may have low testosterone level. And there really is absolutely no information, although a prospective study of puberty and testosterone treatment in Newcastle may give us some information over the next couple of years. Is that something to just think about? So how are we doing uh, about monitoring puberty in the clinic? I'm not so good, really, and that's where we need to sort of improve. So in an audit, in a study that's actually been published in a journal uh, looking at fractures and endocrine issues in Scotland, we found that in 2015, when we extracted the data prior to the new standards of care, that only about half of the boys who are 14 years of older have actually had puberty examined, and I'm sure some of you, if you've got uh, uh, any older adolescent sons, that might be your experience. And of those who actually have had puberty examined, eight, um, close to 80% had no signs of puberty and required testosterone treatment. And I must say the rest of them who actually did not require testosterone treatment were ones who were actually off steroid therapy or on very, very low dose, uh, 10 days on, 10 days off. In the MD Starnet um, um, audit, which has also recently published, so it's data from America, it's kind of fairly similar sort of evidence as well. Uh, that's just, uh, the, the data shows that really only about 5% of all these boys, it's a large cohort, have ever had an endocrinologist review, and only under 2% of boys who would qualify for testosterone, I suppose at the adolescent age, were treated with testosterone. So it sounds like it's something that we've not really looked into as thoroughly and not addressed the issue which we now need to as uh, clinicians in the clinic. So last section, let's move on to bone health and osteoporosis. Uh, so we know that there are many reasons of weak bones, osteoporosis in boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. 
We know that muscle weakness itself can lead to osteoporosis. So for instance, if we've got a healthy uh, young adult uh, man who's involved in a major car accident and has got severe spinal cord injury and is bed bound for three months, for instance, the, this man can develop an osteoporosis and also can develop fractures. So we know that uh, not utilizing muscles, not weight bearing, that's already a risk factor for osteoporosis. Steroids are very good for a whole sort of reasons and you'll hear about um, in, in today and, and all this weekend, but no doubt steroids has an impact not only on growth but also on bone development. So it certainly is another factor which leads to osteoporosis. A lot of boys or some of the boys may also not be out in the sun as often. We don't get very much sun in Glasgow anyway, depending on where you are. So vitamin D deficiency and to some respect nutritional deficiencies, particularly calcium deficiency, might be an issue in some boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And we know about the importance of calcium and vitamin D for bone health. But poor growth itself is also an uh, important uh, factor on bone development because in childhood and, and adolescence, as bones grow longer, uh, this helps bones to become stronger. So actually, if you've got poor growth or no growth, it just means that bones are not developing as well. So that is one factor, but unfortunately, I just said earlier, I'm not quite sure we've got anything very effective to improve growth as yet. And also, as mentioned earlier, if you do not have the hormones, certainly as in an adolescence, delay or absent puberty will also be a contributing factor for, uh, for, for osteoporosis and bone health. So I often get asked this question, so it's not a straightforward answer, but certainly there's multiple risk factors for osteoporosis and bone health in these boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And you'll come to that to, to the end again, and really the target is we need to try to target all these aspects as best as we can. Sometimes not particularly very effectively, but we need to try. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks to Action Duchenne, Muscular Dystrophy UK and the Scottish Government, uh, some of our work uh, will be a couple of posters at, and you can come and talk to me at lunchtime. We certainly know from uh, invasive tests like bone biopsies in steroid treated children, including Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, that these boys have osteoporosis because the bones are just smaller and also thinner. So on figure one, you can see to the left, there is a boy, um, which is a cross-sectional area of the thigh. And you can see that um, the bones are just, so these are, I can walk here, I think you can see that these are the bones, okay? You can see that a boy with Duchenne has got a smaller and also thinner bone. And that's in the uh, hard part of the bone, what we call the cortical bone. But in the spongy bone, you can also see on these MRI pictures, the information that we previously could only uh, in, uh, acquire from bone biopsies, for instance, that in fact the quality of the bone is not particularly very good. So there are certainly, uh, uh, um, at a, a microscopic, uh, at an imaging level and also at a microscopic level from bone biopsies, the bones are not as healthy. And fractures are very common. In our experience in the Scottish cohort, and there's been numerous other studies which have been published, that at least about 50% of boys with Duchenne's will have a fracture. And in some clinics and some cohorts, it's at as high as 75%. And fractures also can occur before steroids. So osteoporosis, because of underlying muscle weakness, is already probably present to some degree prior to use of steroids. But the studies of fractures in boys with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or the frequency of it is probably still grossly underestimated. And come to talk to me at lunchtime and I'll show you uh, some data on why we think so. So the new standards of care focuses a lot more on vertebral fractures or compression fracture of the backbones, which are in fact actually extremely common, we think, uh, and often missed if we rely on presentation with severe back pain and certainly in the past standard of care routine imaging of the backbones and x-ray of the back or the lateral thoracolumbar lumbar spine x-ray was not part of the care consensus and if we just uh, um, depend on the boy to tell us that they've got back pain we think is actually underestimated and, um, and, and results from our poster will show it. So but if there's presence of compression fracture of the back, this tells us that it signifies that the bones are weak, there is osteoporosis because you could still fall, whether you've got Duchenne's or whether you've not got Duchenne's or any one of us, if you've got significant injury, for instance, of the long bones, 
But compression fracture of the spine is something that we see when there's osteoporosis. Uh, up till recently with children with steroid-treated osteoporosis, we really only see it in people either with brittle bone disease or in elderly people with postmenopausal osteoporosis. So what does the new standards of care say? The new standards of care says now that at baseline prior to starting steroids, or if your son is on steroids, at least one to two yearly, these x-rays need to be done routinely. Okay? And it's from the side, it's what we call the lateral x-ray. X-rays for scoliosis, if your son's having it, often it's usually from the front. It won't actually detect but not, may not necessarily detect vertebral fractures, so they need to be from a different view. The standards of care suggest that if your son is not on steroids or stopped steroids, for instance, these x-rays should still be done every two to three yearly. Vitamin D levels should be um, assessed in blood tests at baseline and then annually. And I must say that uh, depending on where you live, I think um, generally, although it doesn't quite uh, recommend it, but in our clinic, every boy with Duchenne is on uh, vitamin D supplementation, and in fact, the levels are still sometimes low. The previous standards of care and what you may be used to is um, of, of monitoring bone is using a DEXA scan or the bone density scan, which you may be familiar with. It still recommends that this needs to be done at baseline and then annually, but it also tells you that you need to prioritize a spine x ray above a DEXA scan. And I'm aware that uh, there are some people who are not from the UK. In the UK, we're very fortunate in a lot of respects because uh, you know, if a test is needed, if your doctor asks for it, that gets done. But in some countries, for instance, insurance and payment is an issue. And if that's the case, uh, we would say that you need to prioritize the spine x-ray above a DEXA scan. Uh, why is that a move away from uh, focusing so much on DEXA scan. So DEXA scan, for those of us who might be familiar with osteoporosis in elderly people, or postmenopausal osteoporosis, is that the DEXA result in elderly people is very useful because it seems to predict fractures. It tells us that if you've got a DEXA level of bone density of a particular level, uh, you've got X percentage of chances of developing fractures. And if it's much lower, the percentage of developing fracture is even higher. But in children, while it gives us an idea of bone density, it doesn't actually give us a fracture prediction. The threshold is not particularly very good. But we know that if vertebral fracture is already present, the bones are very weak. So you should not actually start bone protective therapy, and here I'm talking about bisphosphonate, which I'll go into in the next section, just based on a bone density scan result. But if there's presence of vertebral fractures, regardless of whether your son has any back pain or not, that should be the threshold of consideration of bisphosphonate therapy. So let's look at long bone fractures in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And the audit from our Scottish cohort, which has recently been published, shows that a third of the long limb fractures are actually fractured of the femur, fracture of the hip. And more than half of these are due to very minor falls, just falling from standing, for instance, which just um, gives um, um, testament to the fragility of the bones itself. But for those of us who actually have adolescent sons or adults in wheelchair, a quarter of our limb fractures actually fall from wheelchair. And it's very important, therefore, to consider wheelchair safety and also wheelchair fit. And not forgetting that sometimes wheelchair fit could change in an adolescent and young adult as the condition is deteriorating and they've lost weight. So those are things that need to be thought about as well. I think the environment a factor for protecting bones needs to be thought about and not just purely about medicines. So um, to consider long bone fractures, particularly fracture of the femur, if the severe pain for no particular reason worsened by either walking or movement in the limb in an adolescent or young adult uh, who's non-ambulant, if there's unexplained swelling and bruising on part of the limbs and deformities, for instance, or you've got a son who just doesn't seem to be keen on walking for no particular reason, you need to consider long bone fractures. In an ambulant boy with long bone fracture, um, I think the care consideration, or at least the expert consensus, suggests that perhaps we need to talk to the orthopedic doctors to 
consider using surgical man uh, management of these fractures rather than putting these boys on the cast for about three or four months. Because there's unfortunately some not very um, uh, uh, encouraging data to suggest that in, after the first long bone fracture in a boy with a chance, up to about 30 or 40 percent will actually lose ambulation prematurely. So the idea is to actually not put them in the cast for long periods of time, they lose confidence, but to, to actually encourage them uh, to get back on their feet with dedicated physio program. But obviously, this needs to be assessed on a case by case basis because there are also contraindications to surgery. So it kind of depends on your son. Um, and not forgetting the issue of adrenal insufficiency, if your son's going through major surgery, for instance, and perhaps can't take steroids after having fracture fixation and the surgery, we need to think of steroids on a different route. So those are things to consider. A very rare complication which has been described in a, a certainly small case number of boys with Duchenne's following fall or fracture of the limb is this condition called the fat embolism syndrome. It could be a potentially serious condition. It is as a result of fat particles from the bone or the bone marrow itself, which then circulates into the circulation and it can lead to major breathing difficulties or change in behavior of quite sleepy after a fall. And I must say it's a bit difficult because the thing is, breathing difficulty, some boys may actually have some issues with breathing because they're actually in a lot of pain, for instance, or if you're in a hospital, the saturation level may drop slightly because a young boy is in pain and change in behavior. Well, some boys might need stronger pain medicines and that could cause them to be a little bit sleepy, but it's certainly to be bear that in mind actually and to, uh, and to let the uh, doc treating doctors know because there might be something they're not quite clear of. So let's look into vertebral fractures, and these are the x-rays, which is the lateral x-rays, it's from the side, um, and I'll show you this picture. So you can see a normal spine where uh, the vertebrae are all quite nice and rectangle, and in the middle you can see that there are, this is a boy who, uh, as part of the study, had no back pain, and you can see there's some mild compression fractures because they're just not, uh, not rectangle, and this boy has no pain at all. But on um, the far right, you actually have a boy who already several years ago presented with an agony, with absolute pain, and you can see that pretty much all the uh, vertebrae are affected and compressed. Uh, but as we sort of said earlier, with these new standards of care, it's anticipatory, it's actually identifying problems early, and which is what we hope uh, will occur with these new standards of care. Now, I'm also aware that um, there are now new generation DEXs. We certainly have a bone density scan, which we have in our hospital in some of the centers in the UK, which gives high enough resolution, not just to measure the bone density, but it's also just as good as an X-ray to look at the backbone. And actually, um, if you come to a poster, you can look into that as well. So these new generation DEXs may actually replace a spine X-ray. So some of you may actually say that, oh my God, my son have not had a spine X-ray before, but check with your doctor, because in fact, actually, it may just be that your center has got the iDEXA, which actually allows imaging of the spine at the same time as doing the bone mineral density. And this actually may actually be a useful tool in the future. Um, and I'm quite aware that sometimes some people may not know what a, a bone density scan or a DEXA scan is in the position that a boy needs to be in. So there are usually at least two bits, and if, you actually, if you've got the DEXA machine which allows measurement, uh, evaluation of the spine image as well, um, what we call the vertebral fracture assessment, it probably takes in total about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and you can see the actual uh, scan time. So firstly, your boy will need to lie flat for what we call a total body scan. So just looking at the bone min mineral density in the entirely, uh, entire uh, body. In a research setting, it also gives us some information on the amount of uh, muscle mass and fat mass. That's not routinely clinically reported. And then your son needs to be in that sort of a position to look at the bone mineral density at the back bones and to acquire those images on the on vertebral fracture um, what we call the vertebral fracture assessment, your son then needs to lie on the side, and that's called a vertebral fracture assessment. So if you don't, if you've not done that, it probably means that your DEXA machine can't assess vertebral fractures and you will need a spine x-ray. So I'm also quite aware that actually lots of people have asked me to say, what does my DEXA scan mean? And I think, you know, everybody just gets quite anxious. You get a certain level or your, your doctor might write a report to you and you kind of think like, oh my God, what does it mean? So the bone density or DEXA report should include, generally, 
a total body bone mineral density or bone mineral content. Uh, because DEXA is an X-ray and a two-dimensional technique, comparing DEXA results to age and sex match healthy uh, children is not adequate because most boys with Duchenne's are smaller and because it's a two-dimensional technique, if you compare to age and sex match, the level will be very low. So it needs to be adjusted for size and commonly either for the height of the child, the muscle mass or the bone area. And what you will see in the report on your doctor's left letter is this thing called the standard deviation score. So it'll be something like the total body bone mineral density standard deviation score or a Z score. What a standard deviation score or a Z score means is that it compares to an average boy of a particular age having adjusted for size. If it's zero, it just means that it's average for age, for a boy, and for the size. But if it's lower, so if it's negative two, for instance, it just means that it's lower compared to average. And if it's a little bit higher, positive one, it's a little bit above average. But remember, it stresses families, and I'm very aware of it, but if you've got a slightly negative level, it, a one-off result means nothing. And remember, the standards of care say that it, does, it gives us an idea of the bone mineral density, but it does not predict bone fragility. So just because you've got a son's got a level of minus 1.9, for instance, and it was minus 1.5 a year ago, this does not necessarily mean that your son's fracture risk has increased. So just kind of bear that in mind. It gives us an idea of progression of bone density, but not prediction of fractures. So similarly to puberty, how well are we doing in the clinic? Well, not so well, but I think hopefully with this new updated standards of care and working together with clinicians and patients, we can do better. So in Scotland, again, in the 2015 study on fracture and, aud and, and audit of how we uh, monitor boys, only about 70% of boys in Scotland have had one DEXA scan. And of those, uh, 63 of those who are treated with steroids, you think those that really should be monitored very carefully for the bones, have had one DEXA scan every two years. But actually, we thought that was quite terrible. And in fact, actually, when I presented last year, I got sort of like criticised because it's sort of a major problem in Scotland. But actually, if you look at the data, it's probably not that inconsistent. Um, in the MD Starnet database, for instance, you can see that over a period of sort of almost 10 years, basically, of those who are eligible for DEXAs in this large American cohort, probably only about under 10% actually have had a DEXA scan. So that's not particularly very good at all, and I think we do need to comply with these new standards of care. So let's talk about bone medicine. So this is just a cartoon figure which shows you what happens and what maintains bone health. So there are actually workers or cells which build bones. So this is a, uh, these are cells that are called osteoblasts. But in health, there are also cells which break down bones, and these are called osteoclasts. And in healthy adult, we've got a good balance between the man that's laying down breaks and then a man that's breaking down things. In childhood, on the other hand, because children are building bones, the worker that's laying down bones, i.e. the osteoblast, are in fact actually working harder. Now, in postmenopausal osteoporosis, the problem is of increased bone breakdown. So the osteoclasts are active and working much harder. In boys with Duchenne's, it's probably the main bone problem is, in fact, actually, we're not laying down bones well enough. And this has got some implications with therapy, because a lot more of you would have heard of bisphosphonate therapy. But what bisphosphonate therapy does is that it, in fact, actually reduces bone breakdown. So at the moment, we don't have a very effective drug, and there's none available in children as yet at the moment, to build new bones. And that's really what we need in boys with Duchenne's. So bisphosphonate therapy addressed in the standards of care, and just to talk through it, and like I say, it improves bone by reducing the amount of bone breakdown. It's very useful, effective in postmenopausal osteoporosis because that's the problem, okay? So we're targeting the problem. In steroid-treated boys like Duchenne's, we think that the problem is mainly due to the fact that bones are not built as well. Bisphosphonate therapy can be given as tablets, it does have some side effects of indigestion. You need to sit up for at least 15 to 20 minutes and ideally taken with milk. And I am aware that some people may be on oral bisphosphonate. But the standards of care actually give some evidence to say that why 
oral bisphosphonates are probably not particularly very effective because it, it's not, um, the, the bioavailability of oral bisphosphonate in growing children is very low. So what gets to the circulation in the system is probably not very high. So the standards of care actually suggest that not to use oral bisphosphonate, although I know that sometimes in some instances we've got to consider that. And what the standards of care suggest is that when we do need to use bisphosphonate, we should need to use the IV, the intravenous form, which some of you might uh, already be familiar with, called either pomidronate or zoledronate, and they're much more potent. They need to be given into a drip, and of course some boys don't like drips at all and can be quite challenging. At least in the first infusion and sometimes in subsequent infusion, there can be side effects of fever, nausea, almost like a flu-like reaction. Okay, so that's just to think about. And um, there really is no good published evidence on how effective bisphosphonates are in Duchenne's, but the field based on the very small amount of studies and our clinical experience is that it probably increases bone mineral density. It is unclear if it prevents fracture, but it's very good for bone pain. There's no evidence for the use of preventative use of bisphosphonate. And really, who should get bisphosphonate? Really, if you've got painful vertebral fractures, if there's moderate uh, asymptomatic vertebral fractures, and potentially if they add a long limb fractures. And really there's no good evidence to suggest preventative use of bisphosphonate. We ran a workshop in Europe a couple of months ago to talk about how we develop clinical trials for boys with Duchenne's. And the questions we actually need to consider is that how can we prevent that first fracture? And there needs to be clinical trials, but they're very challenging trials. Are there better medicines to use to treat osteoporosis with less side effects and potentially? And how can we treat osteoporosis in adults with Duchenne's? And those are the questions we need to address. So, summary, good nutrition, particularly good calcium intake, vitamin D supplementations, especially vitamin D monitoring, to encourage weight-bearing activity, not stop your boys from doing activity, from doing ambulant status, treat delayed and absent puberty, and bisphosphonate therapy if there's evidence of fractures, especially vertebral fractures. So this is, I think, my last slide. And really, the summary evidence is that we've talked about adrenal suppression, growth issues, puberty, and bone. And those are the summary of what I've actually addressed. But I also want to end with this stage, where the, you come to these conferences, and you hear of all these complications and things that can occur in your son. But really, the new standards of care is a proactive approach it is to ensure that all boys have a rich and, rich and fruitful life, and it's really to identify health issues at the earliest possible stage to allow intervention. And I think there's a lot of positive and good news for boys and the young men with Duchenne's, and I think we need to live with, uh, uh, leave such talks with that rather than think of all the, all the uh, negative things that can happen. I just want to thank all the neuromuscular team and all the people who have supported us, and I think there are probably a couple of minutes for questions. So thank you very much for your time.